Are you a photographer who takes colour photographs or are you a photographer who takes photographs of colour? How's it, how's it? So I came across Eric Mueller just recently when somebody mentioned his name. And when I looked up about him, it was fascinating. You know, he, he actually worked with Pete Turner for a while. He has photographs in the National Portrait Gallery in the Permanent Collection. He photographed the cover of Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run album. And in 2023, he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Professional Photographers of America. The first photograph, that really captured my attention in this book, especially with the story, is this picture called Church. And Eric's written here, I fell in love with the Great Plains. It was an immediate attraction, the open sky, the flatness of the earth, the vista vision of landscape, the names of the towns, Texhomer, Wichita, Cottonwood Falls, went into my notebooks filled with swatch grass, the sound of wheat rustling in the wind, the crackle of grackles and the abandoned churches grey with time and boarded up. West of the 100th Meridian feels like home where people have their opinions and they may not be yours, but these strangers are your blood type. The laughter of kids at play in the wail of the 448 Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe train line becoming part of you that you take to the grave. I found this church just south of the Canadian border, far north in North Dakota. It was on its frame with the paint long weathered off, the timbers fragile and on hard times. A silent relic and a monument to the faith of those who huddled there. Children were born here and died here. People met and married here and were our fathers and our mothers. They got good news and the bad in a hand printed newspaper that announced who had won the election and who was crowned queen of the state fair. They sent telegrams and received them, straight from the wire. Life was filled with simple pleasures in a place where you amble on the flat land just to watch the sun at the vanishing point, its rays radiating, lit by the fire of the solstice late on a June day, the wood slowly shedding the last invisible layer of primer. I went one summer into the small town on the border and sat down at the counter in a hole in the wall cafe, and I asked the farmer sitting next to me about the church. The lines in his face were like sandpaper that had met a bramble of barbed wire. In the same sentence, he could be your brother or just mad because the sky was blue. He turned to me and he said, that church, that's where me and Lucille was married 66 years ago. And that's where our son was born. And that's where we said goodbye to him after he died in that war. I bit my lip hard. And then we talked for another two hours and close the place. There's so much more in that than just this photograph. This is something that I really love about when you listen or read something that people have written about the photographs that they take, that how they have imbued far more than just a visual aspect into their photographs, that somehow all of that narrative, all of that history and story is encapsulated in these simple yet beautifully effective photographs. As I'm flicking through the book, there were like tons of photographs that immediately jump out at me. But this one caught my eye, this chap sitting down against a wall and it's called Siesta. And it was taken in 1975 in Mexico. In 1975, four years after Starbucks opened its first store in Seattle, I got a call from an art director in Sweden named Bo Zaunders. Bo had designed a campaign for a coffee company called Gevelia, and he wanted to know if I could travel to Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, and Tanzania for several months to photograph coffee plantations. There's nothing like being blessed with color while on assignment for a new friend, and I soon learned that Bo was a gifted photographer, writer, and cartoonist, as well as an art director. It was to be a year of good fortune for me meeting Bo, traveling to far off places to shoot landscapes and portraits and tasting some of the world's best caffeine. What I didn't count on were the gray, overcast, foggy days and the long meetings amongst old friends who drank bourbon, smoked cigars, sipped coffee and told tales about the good old days as they sat for hours around long mahogany tables. Looking back at the photographs I made in a small town in Mexico, I came across this photograph of a man taking a siesta in the late afternoon light. One afternoon, as I listened to a group of men talking, I noticed one of them had fallen asleep. 
oblivious to the banter of his friends and unaware of my camera. The photograph was there for anyone to make and after I took it, I photographed the other men who were deep in conversation. I was on a journey of seeing and I could set the rules and for me, there were no rules other than to shoot what I felt as much as what I saw. As much of what I felt as what I saw. That's wonderful advice. I think so often we get obsessed about composition, and, you know, trying to really create a narrative and get a fancy pants photograph and forgetting to really just tap in to that feeling, that vibe that a place gives us. If you know me at all, then you know that I absolutely am a sucker for <laughs> airports and transport spaces and their roofs in particular. So when I saw this photograph here called Spaceport, I was just like, OMG, absolutely <laughs> love this. This man is starting to tick so many boxes. And here's what he's written about this photograph. Despite Europe's medieval buildings, or perhaps because of them, some of the world's foremost modern architects are there, experimenting with design, geometry and colour. On a trip to England, I was at Heathrow Airport, ready to fly home to New York, when I opened a door and suddenly felt as if I had been transported to a set for the TV series Star Trek. I spent a few hours that evening in this futuristic spaceport, waiting for my transatlantic flight. It was one of those moments when an opportunity to make a photograph is born from serendipity. The soft blue glow was mesmerizing and the swirl of shapes and the shadows gave the appearance of a cocoon that extended into infinite space. I had thought I was entering a conventional, boring airport departure lounge, not a hyper-colored set that resembled Finnish architect Eero Saarinen's iconic and neo-futurist TWA terminal at JFK. I will never forget when I first saw the shape of that concrete bird, its wings extended as if about to fly into the sky, as Eero said of his own work and that of other architects. The purpose of architecture is to shelter and enhance man's life on earth and to fulfill his belief in the nobility of his existence. There is nature and there is architecture, and in the coexistence there are times when the two reach a spiritual symbiosis of one. I absolutely adore this photograph and <laughs> because I'm, I, I want to be architect myself, I, perhaps that's why I'm always drawn to these shapes, these ideas. On the next page, he has some more examples of buildings in Spain and a place in Abu Dhabi. And I love these kind of very abstract, very graphic photographs that are not just about the building, but about the color throughout all of these images. I hope that you're seeing that it's the color that is the star of the show. Eric, I think, has learned so much from his time with Pete about making color first and foremost what you see in these photographs. It's about understanding how colors work together, how you can layer with colors, how to compose with colors as well. Or this idea of color blocking by making the color itself the star of the show by having it dominate the frame. And you see this so much in these photographs of these rusty cars. Eric says here, some of the greatest art is in junkyards, not museums. There's usually a dog, a German shepherd or a doberman whose intense eyes lock on you. A low, deep-throated growl keeps you at bay. Finally, a door opens and the caretaker asks what you're looking for. Cars from the 1950s and 1960s epitomize the fantasy of cars as art. Who can deny rust and time? I only wish they came like this right from the dealer, one of a kind masterpieces worthy of Jackson Pollock or Ellsworth Kelly, products of a half century of nature and oxidation. The chrome still shines from a time when locks required keys. Cars from this era are painted with the most resistant archival paint and the intense chrome yellows, surf greens, cashmere blues, tropical turquoises and matador reds should last 500 years. These relics of the past sit in remote fields in the Dakotas, in the desert of Southeast Oregon, north of Nevada and across Texas, Colorado and the outposts of the Great Plains. You have to keep an eye out for the occasional rattler and you might want to check when you last had your tetanus shot. Whenever and wherever I am in the West, I always make a detour to see what I call junkyard angels. 
Enduring the brutal light of the sun, the scouring wind and the heat of the day, these artifacts reveal an undercoat bristling with color as the iridescent shield of metal morphs into an electric canvas, sitting like a long lost jewel in the overcast light. I wish I was that eloquent about my own photographs. And that's what I enjoy so much from books like this, is that rather than just being a collection of photographs saying, take them or leave them, Erica's taken the time to share his ideas, share his thoughts with us. And as you've noticed, it's not about the technical aspects of things. It's about his connection with these colors, with these times, with these ideas. That's what makes these photographs so fascinating for me because they are more than just a technical exercise. If you're not familiar with the work of people like Pete Turner, Harry Geert, and a whole host of others whose focus is primarily on making color the subject, I would hardly recommend that you investigate their photographs. If you are looking to really get a handle on how to make your images simple yet so effective, look at this photograph here called Fire. This is stunning and I wonder how many people would have wanted to photograph this in black and white rather than thinking about the possibility of the color itself. Eric is a student of Pete Turner and Pete Turner was quite happy to manipulate colors to create a feeling and here Eric's done a fantastic job. And he says, in the early spring, farmers in the Flint Hills burn the tall grass, turning the brush into hundreds of acres of wildfire rushing across the prairie. The American prairie evolved with regular fires caused either by lightning or set by the Native Americans who used fire to burn off the previous year's dead plant growth. After a long winter, burning off invasive trees, weeds, shrubs and vines that compete with indigenous plants allows the hardier prairie plants to grow. Joanna and I stayed in the small town of Cottonwood Falls at the Grand Central Hotel and we would drive west to Clements and the surrounding hills each night to view the prairie fires. Although we both managed to get some incredible photographs, we were often dodging the flames, which could move very quickly and change direction with the wind. The thick clouds of smoke could be overpowering and we returned to our hotel with our clothes covered in soot, our clothing thick with the cloying smell of the burn. On our last trip to photograph the prairie fires, we went just before dusk. As a fast moving fire finally burnt out, I was surprised to see cowboys and horses meandering through the smoldering embers while the crimson flames created a pink and red glow to the smoke. Finally, I had what I was looking for. The cowboy gave a scale to the photograph. Surprisingly, the horses were calm, ambling through the apocalyptic landscape. When I photographed storms in the Great Plains, I also photographed the landscape, the churches, abandoned houses, because I wanted a contextual record of where the storms occur. Although this photograph does not appear in my book, Fierce Beauty, Storms of the Great Plains, it is an important image for me as part of the process of living in as well as seeing the landscape that I photograph. That is an absolutely stunning, stunning photograph. And you'd like to find out more about the guy who taught Eric how to take these photographs, check out this video over here. Thank you ever so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with you. Have a great weekend and I'll see you all soon. Cheers.